Welcome to today's webinar titled Far Off to Fresh Cow Opportunities to Improve Transition Performance. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by Dairy XNet and the National Association of County Agricultural Agents. My name is Mireille Shaheen. I am an Extension Dairy Specialist with the University of Idaho and I will be the moderator today. Dr. Overton received his DVM from North Carolina State University and practiced veterinary medicine for eight years in North Carolina. In late 1998, he moved to Tulare, California to continue his education with the University of California, Davis, where he completed both a dairy production medicine residency and his master's of preventive veterinary medicine degree. After working as a dairy production medicine specialist at UC Davis for six years, he joined the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine, where he served as professor of dairy production medicine. Dr. Overton left the University of Georgia to assume a position with Elanco Knowledge Solution as senior consultant in dairy analytics. In this role, Dr. Overton is responsible for developing economic models and tools for both internal and external customers. He also provides consultative services for large dairy herds and for internal Elanco animal health needs in global marketing and research development. With that, I'd like to um, uh, turn the program to Dr. Overton so he can talk to us about opportunities to improve transition performance in dairy cows. Dr. Overton? All right. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Now, we are going to talk about a variety of challenges uh, of these dairy cows as they go through transition. And we're just going to jump right in. I'm going to first go through some background slides, and then we'll get into some, some specific uh, management keys in terms of trying to improve production during this transition time period. If we think about the transition period, traditionally we've looked at a period of time that uh, ranged from three weeks before calving through three weeks after. Um, but if you look at uh, the current status of things, as we learn more and more about the health and performance of these cows, it's more apparent the transition actually started to dry off and that a full 90-day period, which includes the 60-day dry period and 30 days of, of early lactation, is really critical to achieving um, optimal performance during this transition time. This is also a period of significant stress for a lot of cows, and how a cow performs during this time period is going to determine how she performs in early lactation and how quickly she becomes pregnant, um, and literally how profitable she's going to be for the producer. So before I get, to, get too far in here, I want to actually just lay out for you what I consider the primary takeaway from this presentation today, and that is that managing energy balance and immune function is going to help us mitigate the impact of these transition challenges on dairy cows. Cows undergo tremendous challenges throughout this uh, late gestation and, and early lactation period. She'll go from a, a, an area of about 30 pounds of dry matter intake per day down to often dropping 25, 30, 40 percent of her intake just before calving. She's going to have, uh, hopefully, a rapid rise in intake after calving, but it's not going to keep up with the rise in milk production. So she's going to be in a period of negative energy balance. During this time, she also uh, experiences lots of challenges from a hormonal perspective, from an immunologic perspective, from a metabolic perspective. And we see lots and lots of different diseases that are very common during this transition time period. Uh, metabolic things like milk fever, ketosis. And then you've got some infectious things like um, uh, mastitis and metritis. But if you look at what really kind of sets things up, is two primary things, and that's negative energy balance and immunosuppression. And these two things are actually interrelated. But how the cow handles these challenges is what determines whether she actually survives this time period, whether she survives it marginally, or if she actually becomes a very productive animal and goes on and conceives in a timely manner in early lactation. <clears throat> so if we look at some of the transition management keys I've got highlighted here, the first one, and probably one of the most important, is to minimize that feed intake depression and negative nutrient balance that occurs before calving. Now, notice I'm saying negative nutrient balance and not just negative energy balance. The reality is cows experience negative energy balance, but they also have a negative protein balance during this time period. 
Hence, I'm referring to this as a, ne a negative nutrient balance. The second key is that we need to help the cow minimize the risk and the impact of dystocia should it occur. So how do we uh, decrease the risk of her having a difficult calving? And if she has it, how do we actually mitigate that, uh, that issue as much as possible? The third big key is minimizing the risk and impact of hypocalcemia, or milk fever. The fourth is to minimize the risk and impact of infectious diseases that occur shortly after calving. And I'm primarily talking about mastitis and nitritis in this situation. And the fifth and final key for transition management is to try and help promote a rapid return to positive nutrient balance. And that means we're essentially trying to maximize the rise in feed intake after calving as quickly as possible. I'm going to go through each of these in more detail, but we'll spend most of our time on number one. So as we move forward with this, transition management key number one is minimizing negative nutrient balance and the drop in feed intake before calving. So if we look at what happens during this prepartum time period, um, she typically, as I mentioned before, may enter the dry period at 20, 28, 30, 35 pounds of feed intake and typically will maintain that level of intake throughout most of the far dry and into the early close-up period. But she'll often experience a rather dramatic drop during the last seven to 10 days, especially the two or three days just prior to calving. Now the level and the amount of change of this feed intake has a huge impact on a variety of things. Number one is immune function, and we'll get into that in more detail. It has an impact on the risk of metabolic diseases, such as ketosis. It impacts her uh, level of milk production after calving, as well as her feed intake after calving. Now, in the past, one of the things we used to hear a lot of people say, and I'm guilty of this myself, we used to hear that uh, it said that we needed to maximize the feed intake in the close-up cows. And it turns out that's not exactly the right approach. Uh, a more correct approach would be to say that we need to minimize the decrease in voluntary feed intake. So it's not how high her feed intake is, but rather the big issue is how much does it drop just before calving. So if we look at what's happening relative to calving, I've got a graph up here that uh, actually was, is borrowed from Tom Overton. Um, and it shows on the y, the x-axis, days relative to calving. So we're going essentially from three weeks before through three weeks after. On the left-hand y-axis, we've got dry matter intake in kilos per day. And on the right y-axis, we've got NEFA levels. So as you can see from the solid line, feed intake typically has a decline as we approach parturition, but there's a massive drop in the last week before calving. Corresponding with this drop in feed intake, we see a rise in non-esterified fatty acids. And the bigger the drop in feed intake, typically the larger the spike in non-esterified fatty acid level. Now, after calving, we hope and try to support a more rapid rise in feed intake, because that also will correspond with a drop in NEFAS as she goes into lactation. That's what we're trying to achieve. So let me explain what I mean by NEFAS. If you think about fat stored within the dairy cow and her body, it's typically stored as triglycerides. And triglycerides are nothing more than three non-esterified fatty acids that are chemically bound to a glycerol backbone. So when she mobilizes fat in response to things such as increased energy demand or increased growth hormone that occurs uh, right around calving time or in response to stress hormones, uh, what she does is she cleaves off these three non-esterified fatty acids. She uses the glycerol to help make glucose. And those three uh, NEFAs now are bound to protein and go into the bloodstream. And it's also important to understand that this mobilization of fat is blocked by normal insulin and a normal response to insulin. And that's very important when we think about how do we mitigate some of these issues. If she mobilizes an excessive level of fat, far beyond what she can actually uh, manage within her liver, she's going to actually end up having a condition called ketosis. And ketosis is nothing more than an increase in blood ketone levels. And there's three major blood ketones that I've got listed there. These ketones are excreted in milk and urine. And depending on which test we use, certain tests pick up one or the other of the three ketone bodies. 
But clinically, ketosis is characterized by hypoglycemia, so she's got low blood sugar. She typically has higher levels of NEFAS, higher levels of ketone bodies, and one of the classic things is just a depressed appetite. In a more severe form, these cows will actually exhibit strange neurologic signs. In terms of more background, it's also important to understand that when we're talking about feeding and taking care of dairy cows, they are vastly different from us in that they do not uh, obtain a significant level of glucose directly from their diet. Rather, what they do is they ferment feedstuffs into primarily one of three uh, volatile fatty acids. Now, the first and most predominant is acetate. And acetate is used for primarily for fatty acid synthesis. And it comes primarily from your fiber sources. Think of hay, silage, and so forth. Propionate is a major substrate for gluconeogenesis. So she takes propionate, as well as some other things like amino acids, and she can use that to make glucose. And propionate levels are very, very important because they, number one, stimulate the insulin response that we're trying to uh, cause when we're dealing with these transition cows. Number two, propionate is necessary for glucose, and glucose is necessary for energy substrate for the calf before birth. But it's also required to produce lactose, and lactose is the osmotic driver for reduction of milk. The third VFA we see here is important, but we want to make sure it's rel relatively limited in its amount. Butyrate is also produced primarily from, from forages and some, some grains, but the key about butyrate is it's both a good VFA and a bad one. It's good in that it is the primary energy source for the rumen wall itself, but if it is fed to the cow in preformed sources, or we have an excess production, which doesn't usually occur, that actually can lead to the formation of ketosis because it's a ketogenic VFA. Now, these dairy cows are in a constant state of gluconeogenesis. The need for glucose is going to pick up dramatically just before calving and just after calving. Just before calving, glucose is the primary energy source for the fetus. <clears throat> and it's also important for the production, early production of colostrum. Now, when the animal is pregnant, glucose uptake by the fetus is a more of a passive process. So as long as the cow is producing enough glucose, fetus is happy, it's growing well, it has plenty of energy. The amino acid uptake is more of an active process. And amino acids can be used by the fetus for energy as well, as well as for making proteins, and, and, i.e. the growth of the fetus. When the cow experiences hypoglycemia, a semi-starvation type of state, the fetus will compensate by using more amino acids for energy. Now, it's nice that the fetus has that flexibility. The problem is we actually rob some from the, from the dam supply. It's also important to understand that the fetus does not benefit directly from mobilized fat. <clears throat> if you consider what's happening around this transition time period, let's assume based on Bell's work in 95 that maternal supply of glucose is about 1,500 grams per day and amino acids is about 1,000 grams. The uterus, as you can see in this graph, is going to take up almost 50% of the maternal supply of glucose and over 70% of the maternal supply of amino acids. So when we start to describe diets, we're trying to describe diets that are going to support the formation of glucose by the cow, and also have diets that are going to support sufficient levels of metabolizable protein in order to meet these needs. <clears throat> What's pretty amazing is that despite the high needs she has just before calving, within a few days of calving, her needs for energy i.e. glucose, are dramatically increased over even above what they were just before calving. So here's a cow that has gone from, let's say, 28 pounds of intake down to 15, 18 pounds. She calves, and then she's trying to increase her intake. But, but during this time period, her glucose now is about three times, basically overnight, three times higher level of need compared to the previously pregnant uterus and the cow carrying this calf. Amino acid needs are doubled. Fatty acid needs are almost five times what it was before calving. And so if you look at this all together, it's total energy needs by the, uh, compared to the uterus, it's almost three times increase. So a dramatic increase in the needs for energy, 
But despite this, we've got a low feed intake, and hence we end up with a negative nutrient balance, negative energy and negative protein, because she just simply cannot eat enough to make, make up for what she needs. So the question we have to deal with now is, how does this cow do it? And I'll be honest with you, a modern dairy cow is a pretty amazing creature in her ability to deal with these transition needs. There's two major ways that she deals with these uh, increasing energy needs in, in spite of lower intakes. The first is that she alters a glucose metabolism. And this is what we refer to as glucose sparing. What happens is her tissues have a finely orchestrated approach where she tries to reserve or preserve the glucose for her mammary gland use and shunts it away from tissues like the muscle. She also increases the efficiency and rate of, which she, uh, of making glucose through gluconeogenesis, and she actually starts to use amino acids to make it glucose. Now, that's nice that she has that flexibility, but that's also a very expensive and uh, costly way of doing things for, from a glucose perspective. The second major way she deals with these changes and challenges is that she mobilizes body tissues, as we mentioned before. Now, again, we traditionally think about a cow mobilizing fat, but she mobilizes not only fat, but protein. And so we need to make sure we have ample supplies of labile body protein that's uh, available to support these needs. These changes are mediated in part by somatotropin, or growth hormone, which is going to increase normally around calving. And the other thing that really is important is we focus a lot on liver health. And it's important to understand that the liver is absolutely crucial to her being able to adapt to these changes and these needs. If you consider what the liver might weigh three weeks before calving at about 19 pounds, and then look at it three weeks after calving at about 21 pounds, so we've had an increase in body and, and mass a little bit. But if you look at the oxygen uptake, and this is in moles per day, oxygen uptake here is a proxy for metabolic rate. So think about this as the amount of work that the liver is doing. So three weeks before to three weeks after, it's more than doubled its workload, and yet its weight has only increased two pounds. So what's happening is that liver is really gearing up and becoming more efficient at making glucose, and it has to for this cow to be successful in lactation. So just a quick adaptation summary of what's happening. Of course, at calving, she's got mammary gland that's gone from producing colostrum and now to producing milk. And with that change, she's had an increase in secretory cells. She's got an increase in nutrient needs, nutrient partitioning. And so there's a massive increase in blood supply going through the memory gland. The liver increases in size and its rate of gluconeogenesis. The fatty tissue increases its rate of lipolysis, or breakdown. And the fatty tissue typically is not going to make new fats. It's going to simply continue to break down fats as the cow needs more energy. The rumen increases in size, increases in absorptive capacity, so these rumen papillae will elongate in response to increased levels of VFAs. And then the muscle is kind of sort of the big loser in all this because the muscle is the one that's primarily impacted by glucose sparing. So the muscle is essentially told, you know, don't take up the glucose that's flowing through you, save that for the mammary gland, but it, it compensates by utilizing the mobilized fatty acids. And it actually is quite efficient at burning fatty acids for energy. <clears throat> so what can we do now as we start to walk through this far dry to close up the fresh cow? We're in the far dry group. And what can we do there to better manage feed intake and improve postpartum performance? Well, there's a few key things. Number one is, I think, is probably the most important one, and that is to control the energy intake in far dry cows. Far too often we see rations where the energy level is too high, and overfeeding these far dry cows followed by overfeeding of close-up cows from an energy perspective leads to a greater risk of insulin resistance and problems with ketosis or parturition. So we really need to focus on controlling energy intake. And if you think about it, that really means we can't feed unlimited amounts of corn silage or other high energy forages. Number two is we have to manage the environment. Uh, and here what we're talking about is managing the environment to minimize the stress and additional maintenance needs that will increase weight loss during the dry period. So things like heat stress abatement are very important during the dry, dry period. 
We need to provide adequate and comfortable resting areas. I mentioned in the, in the second point about decreasing the maintenance energy needs. If we don't provide adequate resting, the cow is going to increase her standing time, and she's actually going to promote an increase in maintenance needs, which does us no favors in terms of helping her with this transition. And the fourth thing I will throw out there at you is beware long days dry. Um, there's a couple of studies, one of which we were involved with at University of Georgia, that showed that cows that had longer days dry, and now I'm talking about days longer than 70, even after we adjusted for body condition score and parity, those cows with long days dry were more likely to experience more issues with ketosis and early lactation. So we really have to reconsider whether we want to keep some of these late breeding cows that end up being dried early and then achieve a long day's dry. These cows we know are going to have more problems with ketosis and have a higher risk for DAs and retained placenta and metritis. So given today's high beef prices, that's something we really need to take a long look at, whether we want to truly keep those cows around or not. As we shift into the close-up cows, now we think about a critical group to make sure we're managing properly. And this is where we're focusing on feed intake and all the stressors around these cows. As I mentioned, close-up cows can experience anywhere from 25 to 40 percent drop in feed intake during the last week or so before calving. These cows are also much more sensitive to stressors such as heat stress, stocking density, social issues within the pen. It is during this time also that she now has to deal with the decline in immune function that's brought about at least in part by the negative energy balance she's in, but also in part due to the uh, calcium challenges she has. Subclinical hypocalcemia is a big issue during this late close-up period and early um, lactating period. And of course, this is also where we see more of a negative energy balance because she's dumping lots of energy, lots of nutrients, lots of protein, and lots of vitamins and minerals into colostrum, while at the same time she's supporting very rapid growth of the fetus. So it's a quite a challenging time for the cow. In terms of stress issues, I want to highlight just a few of them here that we need to make sure we keep an eye on. And one is overcrowding. Overcrowding, to me, there's two big issues, two big places. We want to make sure we absolutely do not overcrowd. That is in the close-up pen and in the fresh pen. We're trying to maintain feed intake in a close-up period. And after calving, we're trying to rapidly increase our feed intake. Overcrowding, especially when we have mixed heifer and cow pens, is a big challenge for these cows and a big problem. And traditionally, we've looked at maybe one cow per stall or something like that, but it's become more important. We need to strive for about 30 inches of bunk space per cow during this pre-fresh and fresh period. Pen changes. I know on some dairies, uh, cows can't really seem to get settled down because they're constantly changing pens. We need to try to do what we can to minimize these pen changes because every time she changes pens, she risks now having to reestablish social hierarchy, finding her way around, and it can create issues with uh, maintaining feed intake. I've already mentioned the mixing of heifers and cows, but I just want to say that when we mix heifers and cows, usually it's the heifers that, that end up on the short end of the stick here. Heifers have been shown in numerous studies to, to basically hang out on the backside to free stalls, to not eat what they should, um, they may decrease lying time to five or six hours a day and decrease feeding time to two or three hours a day for fear of being <coughs> kicked around or butted around by cows. <coughs> and finally, if we look at other stress issues, it's going to be poor housing. If you take a look at that picture I've got here on the slide, on the, on the surface it doesn't look that bad until you look a little closer at that cow's legs and look at how high the mud level goes up. So she's in a semi-dry area where she's standing with that newborn calf, but look at what she's had to fight to get to the feed bunk or to the water trough. And we overlook the impact of things like mud and how it can have a big negative impact on feed intake and just increase maintenance requirements. We've got to be really careful about how we handle these cows and house these cows. I mentioned stocking density. It's a really big issue. This is a trial, uh, unpublished field trial out of Wisconsin by Gary Etzel. What they did here is looked at first calf heifers groups with older cows during both the pre and post fresh period. 
they had two row pins with lockups, and they, they had compared stocking densities that range from 62% to 138% of stocks. And when they got after the got into the fresh period, post fresh, there was no over overcrowding at that point. But if you just look at pre fresh stocking density on this graph, we've got milk in pounds per day on the y axis and daisy milk on the x axis, and you've got three different um, modeled feed intake curves here or, or milk production curves here. The bottom one, <coughs> the red line represents 120 percent pre calving or pre-fresh stocking density, and then that green line on top represents 80% pre-fresh stocking density. And you look at the gap there, as you go across days in milk, and there's a substantial difference in milk per cow per day reflected um, or going back to the stocking density. And when they went back and analyzed this, they came up with an estimate of 1.6 pounds per day loss for each 10% increase in pre-fresh stocking density. This is in heifers. This graph is some work I did in California that was unpublished that is pre-farm pre stocking density. This says freestyles. I still need to change that. This is actually at the feed bunk. But pre partum stocking density for mature cows. And the line you see is a modeled, is a modeled feed intake curve. Um, excuse me, a, a milk production curve. And what I want you show, to show you is look at the 100% uh, stocking density. It's right in this area that we start to see the curve start to drop down. So this 100% represents about 30 inches of bunk space per cow per day. So this is 30 inches of bunk space in the pre-fresh. As we exceeded that, I mean, as we had more cows, so less uh, bunk space per cow, her first test production came, became lower and lower. So the cows that had 150% stocking density, so think about this as maybe 15, 16 inches of bunk space per cow. You see a difference of about five pounds of milk per cow per day in the first test. This is just a couple of things showing the importance of the stocking density. Now, if we kind of look at some typical ration guidelines, I borrowed this uh, from Tom again, but we've got some ranges here shown for far dry and for close up. If you look at the protein level, protein is on a crude protein basis it's not very high on either one. But the key I want to point out to you are two things. One is the energy density, and the second is metabolizable protein. If you look at the far dry, we're looking at a net energy of lactation of about 0.6 megacals per pound. And in the close-up, it may go up to 0.63, maybe 0.64. But if you keep one goal in mind, that's about 15 megacals of NEL per head per day whether we're talking far drier or close up. And metabolizable protein, we have now gone, kind of come back around and getting away from crude protein per se, but really looking at what we're providing from a metabolizable protein basis. My goal is for far dry to provide about 1,000 grams and for the close up cows, about 1,200. Now, it doesn't matter if we're talking close up or springing heifers or close up cows. We still need to be uh, fed a diet that's going to provide about 1,200 grams. So if you look at a prepartum heifer have a low, lower feed intake than a prepartum cow, that means that she's got to have a little bit more density from a protein perspective to still meet those metabolizable protein needs. But you see NFC is not very high, starch is very low, and I do also like to increase vitamin E, especially in the close-up period, to kind of help combat some of these um, infectious challenges during that prepartum and peripartum period. The second transition management key is to reduce the risk and impact of dystocia. Now, dystocia, I don't need to remind you, has a big negative impact both on calves and on the cow. And we need to do what we can to reduce these risks. In terms of reducing the risk, one key, if you focus on who is most at risk, it's going to be the heifers. One key is to make sure we grow heifers to an adequate frame without excessive body condition. And one of the things we really like to push right now is intensive heifer rearing. And we talk about having calves uh, or heifers calving in a, body, a larger body mass, i.e. weight, but it's really, really important we have a frame to go with that. 
We're still talking about body condition scores that are maybe three plus or minus a quarter. Um, in order to do this, we need to basically breed on frame size, and we need to be measuring heights and weights periodically to provide some feedback to our program on how heifers are doing. We need to provide clean, stre dry, stress-free areas for calving and provide proper training for calving management for these heifers. From a mature cow perspective, the biggest thing we can do probably to reduce dystocia besides sire selection is going to be to improve reproductive efficiency because if you look at the primary reason we have fat cows in the herd, it's because they failed to become pregnant in a timely manner. So reproduction has a big impact on reducing the effects of dystocia. Milk fever. Uh, milk fever is kind of the third key here. Uh, and when I talk about milk fever, I'm talking about both subclinical and clinical hypocalcemia. Most people are very familiar with the clinical milk fever, but that usually is a very small percent of the total um, number, so 5 to 6 percent. But subclinical hypocalcemia can affect a much larger proportion, and it actually may affect 40 percent of the first lactation animals. Now, we do see an increased risk of hypocalcemia in older cows, and jerseys, um, but we need to keep in mind that we can also have some issues with subclinical hypocalcemia in heifers. And regardless of the parity, when we have subclinical or clinical hypocalcemia, these things are associated with an increased risk of ketosis, displaced abomasum, and metritis, as well as impaired reproductive performance in the future. Recent work out of Florida has attributed a very large percent of the cases we see of metritis to hypocalcemia, essentially subclinical hypocalcemia that occurs around this transition time period. And the reason it's so important is if you look at hypocalcemia, it affects smooth muscle function. So smooth muscle function is related to digestive tract motility and function. It's related to uterine motility and function. But it's also related to immune function. And immune function is going to have an impact on the risk of infectious disease. It's going to have an impact on the risk of retained placenta. All of these things are going to work together to impact milk yield and fertility downstream. So hypocalcemia is a very, very important area for us to focus on. In terms of management of milk fever, we're talking about dry cow nutrition. The traditional approach has been to restrict calcium. Some people have success with this. I actually much prefer a DCAT approach where we're trying to balance cations and anions to achieve a negative dietary cation anion difference. In other words, we're trying to achieve a slight metabolic acidosis. And the desired response with this is that we increase the tissue responsiveness to parathyroid hormone so she's better able to deal with the increased demands for calcium right around calving. The fourth transition management key is to minimize the impact of infectious disease. So we talked about that a little bit with uh, hypocalcemia, but there's two key disease, uh, infectious diseases that impact fresh cows. One is mastitis, and the second is metritis. And these two things have a, a huge impact on early lactation performance and culling risk as well as reproductive performance. And if we want to try to lower the risk of infection, we've got to maintain good immune function both pre- and post-calving. We've got to focus on that subclinical hypocalcemia, and we've also got to look at these other things, such as dystocia, metabolic disease, impact of environment. We've got to really look at that feed intake around that prepartum uh, pre and postpartum period. I'm going to take just a minute to talk about immunity a little bit because it's such, so important when it comes to mastitis and metritis in this fresh period. Uh, can't spend much time because we don't have much time today, and this, these slides are actually out of a three-hour talk I do on transition management. We've only got about 40 minutes a day. But immunity, if we think about combating infectious disease, there's two branches of the immune system that we have to think about. One is the innate immunity, and the other is called acquired immunity. So innate immunity is often called native immunity, and acquired is what we refer to as adaptive immunity. So if you look at kind of the big picture, really getting this thing down into some, some big key concepts. What happens very early after challenge from disease is the reaction of the innate immune system. And this is something that occurs within minutes to hours. 
Later on, we have the acquired immune system kick in and to kind of take over the immune response. Both of these systems need to work together in a coordinated fashion to help protect the cow against uh, infectious disease, whether it's mastitis, metritis, pneumonia, whatever the case may be. But this graph shows how the innate immunity is really what's there at the very beginning. It's the first uh, kind of century that responds. And then we have the acquired immunity that kind of kicks in and takes over as we get into the days to weeks time period after um, immune challenge. But the innate immune response is comprised of three different sections or systems. The first is physical barriers. So we think about mastitis, for example. Two of the highest risk time periods for mastitis are at dry off and at calving. And two things that predispose these cows to having more mastitis is simply leaking milk, so the physical barrier, the teat in itself, is compromised, or she's dealing with some calcium issues. The inflammatory response is what we oftentimes see as a result of infection. If you've ever dealt with a gangrenous mastitis case, what you're seeing there is the inflammatory response gone basically haywire. It's just really over-responded to the issues. The third system is the phagocytic response. So the if infection breaches the physical barrier, then we have an inflammatory response which stimulates a phagocytic response. And the phagocytic response is essentially the neutrophil response, coming in trying to clean up bacteria that are not where they're supposed to be. So neutrophils, or white blood cells, are the first cell of the innate immune system. And these are the ones that invade um, tissues in response to microorganisms being present. And they are the key phagocytic cell, the innate system. You also have monocytes or macrophages that also play an important role. The acquired immune system is something that now has to recognize and destroy these bacterial or viral issues coming in. And these are things that basically uh, develop and retain memory so that when an animal is exposed to a pathogen a second or third time, she is more able to deal with it more rapidly. And if you think about vaccinating dairy cows, what we're trying to do there is elicit the acquired immune response. We're trying to prime it and booster it so that when she gets exposed to a similar pathogen in the future, she is now much better able to deal with it, recognize it, and eliminate it. So the acquired immune system, as I mentioned, is slower. It's something that's going to take weeks to day, uh, weeks uh, Week, days to weeks to kind of respond. They have to identify the specific antigens associated with bacteria. And you've got two different components of the acquired system. You've got the humoral immunity, i.e. the antibodies, and then you have the cell-mediated response. And as I mentioned, acquired immunity is the basis behind all the vaccine strategies we have, uh, whether it's for mastitis or pneumonia or calf scours, there's a variety of things we try to vaccinate cows for, and what we're trying to do is elicit the acquired immune system's help. And the acquired immune system, the key white blood cell here is the lymphocytes, and we've got two primary ones here, the B lymphocyte and the T lymphocyte, but we just don't have time to get into this much today. But when we look at these transition cows and the changes they're going through, they're dealing with hormonal changes, uh, they're dealing with the calcium changes, they're dealing with energy balance, and these changes challenge her immune system and make it so she's much more susceptible to all kinds of infectious disease in addition to the metabolic disease. And one of the key hormonal things we see is an increase in cortisol that occurs just before calving. And one reason we focus on trying to reduce stressors as much as possible is that we don't want to contribute to the already increased level of cortisol by stressing the cow and have her release even more higher levels of cortisol, because that's a known um, immunocompromising agent. So it really suppresses the immune system by having that. So one of the big keys we have is trying to make sure we feed these cows a carefully balanced diet. We encourage and allow them to eat all they would like to eat i.e. we get rid of obstacles that prevent them from eating what they want. We want to provide a clean environment for them to have a comfortable, dry place to rest, but we also want to provide a clean environment to reduce the risk of pathogen exposure. And this is where management is very important. 
<clears throat> so I talk about the immune function, but one thing we haven't really mentioned a whole lot yet is retained placenta. And a lot of people think about retained placenta, and they think about oh, twins, or you think about um, having a big calf or a dystocia leading to, to retained placenta. And that's true, but the largest contributor to retained placenta is most likely related to immune dysfunction, so a compromised immune system. And this theory was first proposed by Gunnick back in the 80s. So when the, when the cow calves, and then she stops the blood supply to the placenta, it actually becomes a foreign body. So she's tolerated it during, during pregnancy, but after calving, she's got to get rid of it. And if it doesn't come out very quickly, her immune system has not got to recognize and attack this. And that's where it becomes very important that she has a good immune response. The cotyledons from RP cows have been shown to have less white blood cell attractants than the cotyledons from normal cells. In other words, they can actually find differences in the immune response in cows with retained placenta and cows that were normal. <clears throat> This work was actually repeated and followed up by Kimura et al. And they found they could actually predict who was more likely to have a retained placenta by examining the function of neutrophils, or white blood cells, before calving. Pretty interesting stuff. But retained placentas, to me, are a really big key monitor for looking at transition performance. And if I had just one thing that I could monitor for these transition cows, it would be the level of retained placenta because it really points out a lot of information for us. So we talked about this periperturing energy metabolism, immune dysfunction, disease. And so we see here two of the big drivers. If you look at this, poor immune function. So poor immune function has a big impact on the, the uh, effect of and function of neutrophils, lymphocytes, but also hypocalcemia has a huge impact. And these two things together impact the immune response. And with an impaired immune response, we have an increased disease susceptibility. And then we see these big um, outcomes, mastitis, retained placenta, and uterine infections. And then the uterine infections don't just start with metritis right away. It becomes endometritis and leads to chronic or subclinical endometritis. And that's what really has a big negative impact on reproductive. So this is what leads us now into our transition management key five, and that is we're trying to promote a rapid return to positive energy, positive nutrient balance. We're trying to promote a rapid rise in feed intake. And if we can do this successfully, we're going to have less risk of ketosis problems. We're going to have higher early lactation performance. We're going to have less weight loss, and we're going to have an earlier return to cyclicity. <coughs> Now, the key to getting this done is nothing really magical, but the key is to reduce all the stressors that are holding cows back. We can't put a gun to her head and say, eat or else. What we can do, though, is remove things that are holding her back. We can try to mitigate the impact of some of these metabolic issues on her feed intake and immune response. We can improve cow comfort by having carefully designed and uh, adequate numbers of free stalls clean, dry bedding areas, whether we've got bedded packs or dry lots or whatever we're housing cows in. And we have to make sure that we provide high-quality feed on a consistent basis and have to be very careful with our stocking density. Again, this is during the prepartum and the postpartum period, two very, very important time periods. What I want to kind of end up with here is a little bit about time management or mismanagement. I've talked about cow comfort. I've mentioned that word several times. What we're talking about is a, at providing adequate time for resting. If you look at uh, a cow's time budget over a 24-hour time period, essentially we're allowing, allowing two to three hours for the milking time, about five hours for eating and drinking. Of course, that's going to be split up into multiple meals. About two hours that cows just like to socialize, interact with each other. One hour that we'll see cows kind of standing and hanging out in the stalls which leaves us about 13 hours out of that 24-hour day for, for lying, for rest. The problem now is what about all the management things we've got to get done? We've got to monitor these fresh cows. We've got to breed the cows. We've got to apply our time AI protocols if we're doing that. <coughs> we've got to make sure we can handle all that. The problem is if we do things like three or four X milking 
and we don't have our pen and our parlor matched up size-wise, we can contribute to excessive time spent milking. So instead of the two or three hours per day, maybe that's at five hours. And with the extra five hours, we haven't done anything else. We now have actually two hours of forced lockup time for these fresh cow programs. All of a sudden, what happens is she's got to compromise and pull time away from other things. And the two areas she shorts is the eating, drinking time, and the resting time. And so if you look at this type of impact, we might be looking at a two to eight pound milk loss and an extra quarter and three quarters of the body condition score loss of the first 100 days. Finally, dry matter intake is the key driver behind early cyclicity and not level of milk production. One of the most common things I hear people say is I've got high producing cows and they're just not gonna start cycling in a timely manner. Well, there's a number of studies out there that say that's not the case. The key is not level of milk production, but the single biggest predictor for when a cow resumes cyclicity is how much feed intake she's consuming and how quickly she increases that feed intake. So cows that actually have are early ovulators, if you look at fat-corrected milk versus dry matter intake, you'll find these cows that ovulate early are having a higher level of feed intake relative to the level of milk production. And so when you look at similar levels of milk production, early ovulators are going to have a much higher level of feed intake during that early postpartum period. So we've talked about these five transition management keys. We've got to minimize dry matter intake depression prepartum. We've got to minimize the risk and effect of dystocia. We've got to minimize the impact of subclinical and clinical hypocalcemia. And I'm throwing in here hypomagnesemia. We've got to impact, minimize the impact of mastitis and metritis. And finally, we've got to do our best to try to promote a rapid return to positive energy balance. So these are kind of the five transition management keys. I ran through this stuff very quickly, but I wanted to try to make sure we had at least a few minutes at the end for any questions that people may have. Um, so if you have some questions, please let me know. Um, and any comments are greatly appreciated as well. So with that, I thank you for your time and look forward to answering any questions if we might be able to do that. Dr. Overton, I have a question. Uh, what's your opinion about, you know, like in the West, sometimes we allow cows to calve and the close up pens. So okay. what's your opinion on that? And when, if not, when do you recommend cows getting moved to maternity pens? <laughs> all right, so two very good questions. First of all, I'll attack the, the close up pen calving thing first. It, in my experience, if I've got a well bedded, dry close up area, think uh, in the West, dry lot dairies with the uh, good shade space. I personally have no trouble with the cows calving in that. The one downside is going to be your, your heifers, your springers. Um, and the issue with that is they're going to have a higher likelihood or risk of needing assistance. So some of my best facilities actually had close-up pens adjacent to a working area. And they had the ability that if a cow was um, was observed to be in labor for a longer period of time, they could easily move the cow into the management area and assist her. The problem is that we have a very big area where it makes it very, very difficult to get these cows up and provide assistance. But I really don't have any problem with the cow calving in the close-up period. It actually now has negated that need for another move. In terms of the time for moving cows, that's an area of ongoing research right now. I know Katie Proudfoot and some of the others um, up in Canada and British Columbia have looked at that. Uh, Gustavo Schunemann in Ohio State's doing some work in that area. Jerome Carrier did some work when he was in his graduate program looking at that. My personal preference is to, number one, make sure the cows are not moved into a maternity pen or calving area during the last uh, eight to ten days before calving. And in other words, I want them to be wherever they're going to calve for that, inf that full close-up period or move her in a just-in-time fashion for calving. So when you notice that the cow is experiencing labor, we can go ahead and quietly, carefully, gently move her into the maternity pen and then allow her to calve. What I'm trying to avoid is two things. One is to move her two or three or four days before calving where she's now in solitary isolation for 
um, an extra day or two. That's going to dramatically negatively impact feed intake. And the other thing is that I want to make sure that the close-up facilities are designed so that we can easily facilitate a move if we need to in a stress-free manner. Heifers are more susceptible to the stresses of being moved during parturition. It can lead to some increased risk of stillbirths, um, but I like to move them just in time. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat box. Um, what kinds of management interventions can we make to optimize protein metabolism at calving, and are there any data supporting exercise of dry calves? Okay, that's coming out of University of Georgia. Um, kinds of management interventions can we make to optimize protein metabolism at calving? Um, if, I've, if I understand that question correctly, we're really talking about achieving that 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein in the diet, and in that situation, we want to make sure that we have high-quality protein sources and that we're matching up by nitrogen and fermentable carbs in the right levels so that we can get that 1,200 grams metabolizable without dramatically overfeeding uh, protein. So a lot of the successful diets, we have a little bit of a high-quality animal-based uh, protein. Um, we have to probably cut back on some of our uh, cheap byproducts where the protein sources are not as available. In regards to the data supporting exercise of dry cows, I, I seem to recall some older studies that looked at cows that were forced or allowed to walk um, throughout pasture situations, and those cows seem to have less difficulty with calving issues. I know some people will actually place far dry feeding areas and water at opposite ends of a larger corral or pen so that the cows are actually having to walk back and forth a bit to encourage exercise. But the flip side of that is I don't know that I've ever actually observed negative impacts of not providing exercise as we see more herds go into a freestyle style system for housing dry cows. So I'm not sure that the data is that clear on the exercise needs for dry cows. Um, uh, while we're waiting to see if you have any more questions. Um, um, another question also about moving cows. Do you think, I mean, are there, there a data that support that there should be a minimum number of cows uh, that should be moved at the same time into the close-up pen? That's a, that's a great question. I was trying to look at that myself just uh, a few weeks ago because I recall uh, early work by Jack Albright or one of the pioneers of animal behavior work. And I seem to recall people talking about the need to move animals in groups versus as individuals. And the key behind that is when we move cows in groups, they are able to maintain a little bit of a social structure as they go from one pen to the next. The, <clears throat> the real impact of that probably varies, to be honest with you. When we're taking groups of 25, 30 cows from a 300 cow pen and putting them into another 300 cow pen, um, it's probably nice for them to be able to maintain some of their own social groups and decrease the social hierarchies. But the need for those groups um, in terms of at least 10 cows at move time is going to be reduced when you've got animals that have been moved maybe from one pen to the next and they're with cows they've previously been accustomed to or known. So, I think that key impact is going to be, are they going to a truly novel group, in which case I think the group numbers that they're moved in is better. To take that a step further, I think there's also some work to show that cows settle in better when we move them at night. But I'm not aware of too many producers that are going to try to move cows at night to negate some of the social issues, unfortunately. Okay, well, um, I guess I don't see I don't see any other questions. With that, I'd like to thank Dr. Overton for sharing his knowledge with us, and we'll see everyone on April 8th. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much.